Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Muscle Health Research Center seminar this afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Ryan Mayu from McGill University in the Department of Human Nutrition. Say a few words about Ryan's background. He got his PhD at Laurentian University in Sudbury in 2008. Uh, he then moved to Ottawa to do postdoctoral work with Mary Ellen Harper at the University of Ottawa and then also at Carleton University and then at Health Canada where he did some work um, studying mitochondria. He was then hired at uh, Memorial University in St. John's, Newfoundland, where he was an assistant professor for four years in the Department of Biochemistry. And then he was recruited where, uh, to where he is now at McGill University. He's an assistant professor there. He's been there a year and a half. And, uh, you know, just a short time ago when COVID hit is when he moved in. And so it's been difficult to get, Ryan's telling me that it's difficult to get set up in a COVID time. I don't envy that. I understand the difficulties, but we're really anxious to hear about Ryan's uh, talk today, which is entitled The Molecular Oxygen Power Redox, Targeting the Glutathione for Treatment of Metabolic Disorders. Sounds fascinating. Ryan, uh, if you don't mind then, uh, share your screen and turn on your microphone and uh, we can get started. Uh, okay, great, thank you very much uh, for the very, uh, the very nice introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to share um, with everybody at York University and the MHRC what, um, my, what my group has been up to for the past five and a half years. Uh, so um, you'll notice in, in the title, I tried to shoehorn in a, a pun uh, based off of Kelvin Dave, Davies' uh, molecular oxygen paradox, uh, which stipulates or was coined because we um, are uh, or aerobic organisms are dependent upon oxygen metabolism to make energy, but also other processes as well to drive hydroxylation reactions, for example. Uh, but we're also always being traumatized uh, by its toxicity. And this toxicity orig originates from the chemistry of oxygen, molecular oxygen. We have to remember that because it only has two lone electrons in its uh, outermost antibonding uh, anti orbital, I can only accept one electron at a time. So as it accepts one electron at a time, it forms dangerous molecules called reactive oxygen species. Um, so it's these reactive oxygen species, also other properties of oxygen as well, for example, its ability to oxidize iron and precipitate it, which led to one of the greatest mass extinctions on our planet 1.8 billion years ago. We often call it the great oxygen catastrophe because cyanobacteria were photosynthesizing uh, the Earth's uh, yellow sun uh, they were photosynthesizing to make energy. Uh, the, at the same time, they were utilizing those photons of light to cleave water to make uh, to, to liberate electrons to drive ATP production. But it also led to the dumping of tons of molecular oxygen into the atmosphere. And anaerobic organisms weren't prepared for it. They didn't have uh, the defense mechanisms to deal with the oxidative properties of oxygen. So it led to a mass die-off of unicellular organisms on our planet. But there's a small fraction of them that survived and they managed to adapt to the oxygen enriched environment that we live in today. And if they didn't adapt, then we would probably would not exist. So it's through these adaptations that they are able to uh, uh, incorporate molecular oxygen into their daily routines, for example, energy metabolism, but they had to protect themselves. So one of the adaptations they had was antioxidant defenses. So the antioxidant defenses evolved with the uh, utilization and the adaptation to oxygen. But there are also uh, evolutionary things that actually happened at the same time uh, during this period. So uh, it's not only adapting to reactive oxygen species and oxygen to protect yourself, but organisms along the way incorporated reactive oxygen species into their daily routines. And one of these daily routines happens to be redox signaling, where uh, organisms such as ourselves use hydrogen peroxide as a second messenger. It has to be produced in a controlled fashion. You need antioxidant defenses there to protect you from oxidative distress if hydrogen peroxide happens to occur at a much higher concentration. But nonetheless, it's important 
either way. And we know now that hydrogen peroxide as a secondary messenger plays a myriad of physiological roles. And hence the reason why I put redox into paradox because oxygen and its reactive species that are generated from its metabolism can be dangerous. But if we actually produce reactive oxygen species in a controlled man manner, they could be very beneficial. Now, one of the redox signaling mechanisms that my group actually focuses on is something called the glutathione alone. Now, this is a ubiquitous and reversible redox sensitive uh, cellular modification that occurs when glutathione, reduced glutathione, is added or removed from a protein cysteine file within a cell. And I say they're ubiquitous because um, their uh, glutathione elation is actually involved in the regulation of a number of cellular processes within mammals. And today, what I'm going to be talking about is two things. Uh, one thing is something that we've been looking at for the past five and a half years, and that's the role of glutathione elation in serving as a negative feedback loop for the inhibition of reactive oxygen species production. Now, we have to remember that this is a temporary inhibition of the enzyme that produces ROS. You need to remove that glutathione afterwards to restore the activity of that enzyme, which leads into the second part. Uh, aberrant and prolonged glutathione elation events specifically within mitochondria and in other parts of the cell can actually lead to the development of metabolic disorders. And some of the stuff we're doing now is looking at how do we target the glutathione alone to deglutathionate de proteins in order to reactivate enzymes to improve fuel combustion in uh, tissues such as muscle for the treatment or prevention of metabolic disorders like obesity and related disorders associated with that. So let's just start a little bit with mitochondria. So we know that there are double membrane organelles. They have a semi-permeable permeable outer membrane and a selectively permeable uh, inner mitochondrial membrane. And uh, mitochondria fulfill a number of different cellular functions. So ranging from buffering calcium to engaging in apoptosis and cell death. But a lot of times these other functions are overshadowed by the fact that they're masters of energy converse, uh, conservation. And this is by virtue of their sex selectively permeable inner mitochondrial membrane, and their capacity to combust fuels in the presence of oxygen to make large volumes or, or, or amounts of ATP, which is then exported into the cell to do work. Now, how does, how does the mitochondria actually extract or combust these fuels? So these fuels actually enter within the mitochondrial matrix where they're systematically combusted and oxidized to liberate electrons. And this is achieved by a variety of flavin-dependent and flavin-independent dehydrogenases. And these electrons are then shuttled to the electron transport chain. It's within the, within the electron transport chain in the mitochondrial inner membrane that they're passed all the way to the terminal electron acceptor oxygen at the end of the chain, reducing it to water. Now we have to remember as well that electron flow from the fuel all the way down to molecular oxygen at the end of the chain, excuse me, is thermodynamically favorable. So this electron flow can be coupled to the pumping of protons into the intermembrane states. And once this proton gradient has been established, it's then tapped by complex five to make ATP. The only caveat to this process is uh, electron flow to oxygen at the end of the chain is not perfectly coupled to uh, the production of ATP. And at various points within this electron transport chain, as well as other enzymes, electrons can prematurely spin off and react with oxygen to give rise to reactive oxygen species. And now when we, we talk about reactive oxygen species in this context, typically bioenergeticists are referring to superoxide or hydrogen peroxide because these are the proximal ROS that are being generated by mitochondria when they're respiring. And then these molecules, specifically hydrogen peroxide and superoxide, can go off into the cell and induce oxidative stress, or they can participate in signaling. So we all know what oxidative stress is and what happens to tissues when there's too much ROS running around. Uh, reactive oxygen species have actually, uh, and its relationship with living organisms has been studied for over 100 years, especially in uh, the mammalian context. Uh, it started uh, over 100 years ago with the discovery of catalase. And then after that, in the 1950s, you had the formulation of the free radical theory of aging by Denham Harmon. And then right after that, Chance and Bovaris found that liver mitochondria can actually generate high volumes of reactive oxygen species. So the relationship between mitochondria and the free radical theory of aging actually fit really well together. And it was thought for many years that mitochondrial dysfunction and the overproduction of reactive oxygen species actually led to tissue dysfunction and damage leading to disease and aging and death. Now, it wasn't until the 1980s that we actually saw 
the term oxidative stress being defined. And this was defined by Helmut Sees. He's a legend in the field. And he defined it as when ROS levels are high enough to overwhelm a biological system's ability to eliminate them or repair the resulting oxidative damage. Now, in this particular case, we have our mitochondria, but let's imagine for one second that the mitochondria are dysfunctional. There's something wrong with the flavin-dependent dehydrogenases or there's blockage within the electron transport chain. This can lead to an increase in the availability of electrons within the electron transport chain or within your flavin-dependent dehydrogenases, uh, resulting in the overduction of these centers and the transfer of a lot of electrons to oxygen, giving rise to an increase in superoxide and hydrogen peroxide production. Now, this increase in the production of both uh, reactive oxygen species can result in many things. So the first thing that can, hap can happen is it can exacerbate the amount of ROS being formed. Now, in this particular case, we have something called ROS-induced ROS release. So the overproduction of superoxide and hydrogen peroxide by a few damaged mitochondria results in the feedback of these reactive oxygen species on other mitochondria, resulting in damage to these mitochondria, dysfunction in electron transfer reactions within these mitochondria, and an, an increase in ROS production from these newly damaged mitochondria. These Reactive oxygen species can also feed back on their sites of their own production and induce more damage to the mitochondria or induce more electron uh, transfer damage, resulting in increased reactive oxygen species production and cellular damage. So the thing to remember too is that superoxide is not really super. It's kind of a weak oxidant and a weak reductant at the same time, but what it does really well is it reacts with iron sulfur clusters very quickly at a rate of 10 to the seven molar seconds. Now, when superoxide is not being eliminated by superoxide uh, dismutase or, or there's an overabundance of superoxide, it's reacting with these iron sulfur clusters located within your mitochondria, which has a two-pronged effect on your cells. The first thing is it disables iron sulfur cluster dependent enzymes like aconitase, fumarase, or complex one. This can exacerbate the damage or exacerbate the amount of ROS being formed because electron flow is going to be perturbed. The second thing that happens is that we have an expansion of the labile iron pool and labile iron can actually react with hydrogen peroxide to give rise to the dreaded hydroxyl radical, which induces cellular damage as well. So this is the basic framework for how mitochondria participate in oxidative stress and why there's such dangerous sites for reactive oxygen species production within mammalian cells. And this was the concept that a lot of people were researching for a very long time. But there was one caveat to it. During the same period when Helmut Sees came up with the definition for uh, oxidative stress, everybody was all over uh, studying mitochondrial dysfunction, reactive oxygen species production, and its role in aging and the pathogenesis of a variety of different diseases. There was more and more work coming out showing that hydroperoxide or superoxide produced naturally within cells does have benefits. Uh, during the same period, for example, when Helmut Sees coined that uh, the, the definition for oxidative stress, they're also finding that there's NADPH oxidase within neutrophils, for example, that's generating superoxide for the elimination of pathogens. Now, at the time, they thought, well, you know, this is just reserved for the neutrophils, right? So this is just something that they have. They have an NADPH oxidase that's dedicated to eliminating pathogens with superoxide in the production of RNS. Then it came out that there was NADPH oxidase isozymes found in all tissues and cells within mammalian systems. And then mitochondria started to figure into it as well. And people started to look into mitochondria. Okay, so can mitochondria, we know there's significant sources of reactive oxygen species. Do they utilize reactive oxygen species to drive physiological functions? So now this was published uh, by my group in 2017. Uh, Helmut Sees gave, a, gave a, another great update on it in 2020 with Dean Jones. But now we know that uh, hydrogen peroxide is actually what we call a mitokine. It's a second messenger that's utilized by mammalian systems to drive a number of different physiological functions. Now it's not an on or off switch, but more like a gradient. And this gradient of responses depends on how much hydrogen peroxide is available. So we can see here that when we have a low amount of hydrogen peroxide being released by mitochondria, now we just have bursts of hydrogen peroxide production coming from these mitochondria. It's nice and controlled. The cell is protected. It's actually involved in insulin release sensitivity. We, we know now it's involved in circadian rhythms, uh, a variety of other pathways as well. The muscle healing one's really cool. This is something that uh, Navdeep uh, 
Shandell did a couple uh, a year ago or a couple years ago. Uh, T cell activation, but as we get into the higher concentrations involved in cell signaling and even apoptosis, and even that's a signaling mechanism. So this forced, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to say forced, but uh, it, it made a helmet and a Dean go back to uh, the, the, the proverbial drawing board and uh, basically resolve the question, what's the difference between an, a meaningful oxidative stress where it's physiologically beneficial versus one that's damaging. So if you look in the literature, if somebody's talking about uh, oxidative stress signaling, well, you can get that confused with an oxidative stress that's causing damage. So what they did is they decided to go back into the literature and do some exploration that allowed them to come up with two new definitions that extended off of the original definition for oxidative stress. The first one is eustress. So the eustress refers to a physiologically meaningful oxidative stress where a small increase in ROS triggers adaptive responses. So in this particular case, what's happening is there's short controlled bursts in hydrogen peroxide production coming from, let's say, mitochondria or another part of the cell that's being utilized for the targeted and reversible oxidation of protein cysteine thiols to elicit some type of cellular response or a change in cell behavior. The next term that came up was, was distress. So we have oxidative distress. This is where we would find the classical definition for oxidative stress. This is when you have excessive ROS loads on cells for an extended period of time, resulting in a disruption of redox signaling and oxidative damage. Now the oxidative damage is associated with the disruption of antioxidant defenses as well as repair systems, but we also have disruption of redox signals. Your cells have an entire redox ohm, and we know, for example, with glutathione elation, there are over 2,000 targets for glutathione elation within muscle. So if you have disruption of these redox signals, that's very bad for your cells. And essentially what happens here is you don't have targeted oxidation of proteins anymore. You have non-targeted oxidation or the irreversible oxidation of a protein. So based on this in the same paper, they came up with a really nice figure that I, I really like. Uh, so they are able to de demonstrate that this gradient in hydrogen peroxide uh, availability uh, is what sets the difference between eustress and distress. So you can see here, they were able to calculate that down to the 10 nanomolar range, hydrogen peroxide is eliciting uh, cellular responses such as proliferation and differentiation. And once you get up to about 100 nanomolar, that's when you start seeing stress responses. Now. That's when you also start crossing into the realm of distress. And, and even Helmut will admit that there's a big gray area uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in, for the definition of eustress versus distress, because in the same concentration range, we have to get, again, remember we have this gradient. Uh, you're not only inducing stress responses, but you also have other important processes being induced, such as inflammation, but also inflammation, too much inflammation can be bad for you as well. So this is why there's a gray zone. But as you increase the concentration to the micromolar range, that's when you get into the distress zone. So you see tumor growth, metastases, growth arrest, and cell death. So how does hydrogen peroxide signal within a cell? So um, basically what happens is that there has to be a reversible oxidation event on a protein cysteine thiol. And this protein cysteine thiol needs to be accessible to the aqueous environment. So hydrogen peroxide has to be able to get there and through an electrophilic attack be utilized to oxidize that protein cysteine thiol. But what needs to happen first though is there, there are a couple of other things that need to happen. So first of all, a protonated thiol is not a very good nucleophile. Uh, so the first thing that needs to happen is it needs to be deprotonated to form a thiolate ion. And a thiolate ion outside of uh, selenium, which you find in a very, selected, uh, sub, uh, a very select number of proteins that are involved in antioxidant defense only, aside from selenium or selenocysteine, uh, a protein cysteine thiolate is a very good nucleophile. So this nucleophile attacks the hydrogen peroxide, resulting in the formation of sulfenic acid. Now, what happens with the sulfenic acid is two things. It can be re resolved by glutathione elation, which we'll talk about in a second, or it can be oxidized further to a sulfenic acid and then resolved very slowly by sulfur redoxin. Now, I, I, there, there are a handful of proteins within the cell that have been found to be modulated through the reversible formation of a sulfenic acid. Excellent example of this is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase 
which undergoes a formation of a sulfenic acid within its active, active site, which allows for the diversion of carbon coming in through glycolysis towards the pentose phosphate pathway to make more entity pH of ribose sugars. It's also reversible, so we know now that it can be reversed by glutathionylation as well. But like I said, there's only a handful of proteins that can do this, and there's a very good reason for that. So it's difficult to actually imagine that hydrogen peroxide is mediating these signals directly because the first thing is that its concentration occurs at 10 to 100 nanomolar. Peroxide actually reacts very slowly with thiols, not thiolates, but thiols. So you need to have a type of environment or a microenvironment within the protein that allows for the deprotonation of that particular thiol. And the reason for that is because a thiol has a pKa of roughly around 8.5. So this means that in a cellular environment, unless the conditions are right to lower that pKa, for example, uh, positively charged amino acids in the vicinity or the proteins in the matrix of mitochondria perhaps, uh, the thiol uh, ionization might not occur. So uh, hydroperoxide reacts with the thiol itself very slowly. So roughly around 50, uh, 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 50 moles per second. The, the third thing is that sulfonic acid groups are quite unstable. So once they get formed, they can either go under, they can either serve as a nucleophile or undergo electrophilic attack. And we see that here in this particular diagram where hydrogen peroxide is reacting with the, uh, the sulfonic acid again to generate sulfonic acid. The other thing too is if there's an overabundance of hydrogen peroxide within the vicinity of, of that protein cysteine thiol, it can result in the irreversible oxidation of this sulfonic to a sulfonic acid. The other thing too as well is that sulfonic acids react very rapidly with a lot of different aldehydic groups. Uh, so for example, if you have 4-hydroxy-2-nonanol in the vicinity, it's going to react with the sulfonic acid to form a irreversible atom. Finally, reactions are not enzymatically mediated. So to this day, we still don't know if there's an enzyme that can actually allow for the targeted hydroperoxide induced oxidation of a thiolate anion to a sulfonic acid. And then finally, even though hydrogen peroxide, we know it's a second messenger, uh, it gets quenched really quickly. So at the site of production, it's not going to travel very far because antioxidant systems like the glutathione uh, antioxidant system or the thyroid oxygen system uh, can quench hydrogen peroxide at a rate of 10 to the 5 to the 10, 10 to the 8 molar seconds. So it's not going to travel very far anyways. So this is where glutathionylation comes in. And it's not, again, to say that hydrogen peroxide isn't a signaling molecule. It most definitely is. But like a lot of other signaling programs within cells, you need to amplify the signal. You see this with cyclic AMP phosphorylation, where once the signaling program has actually been induced, you have levels of amplification of that signal to elicit a very rapid cellular response. And this is where what we get also with redox signals, because redox signals do induce rapid responses within cells because they serve as the interface between changes in cell behavior and changes in the extracellular environment or the exposome. So glutathionylation might fulfill this role uh, very nicely in terms of amplifying hydrogen peroxide signals. So glutathionylation itself, as I mentioned, involves the rapid addition and removal of a glutathionyl moiety to and from a protein cysteine thiol. It's highly responsive to changes in hydrogen peroxide availability. So you can see here we have oxidation of our glutathione pool, and this results in the modification of your protein with glutathione. We also know through 20, 30 years of research that if um, you add NADPH dependent systems or you activate these NADPH producing systems, it restores the reductive capacity of that glutathione pool, resulting in deglutathionylation. So how, why would it serve as such an important mechanism for signal amplification uh, for hydrogen peroxide? So unlike hydrogen peroxide, glutathione occurs in high concentrations at about one to five millimolar. Uh, this is higher in liver, so in liver cytoplasm, you'd see it around 10 millimolar. The reactions are quite rapid, so they could go up to 10 to the five, 10 to the six molar seconds. They're reversible. And one big thing here as well is we know that proteins have a glutathionylation motif. The other thing as well is that we, we know there are a handful of proteins within cells that can uh, react directly with hydrogen peroxide to form a sulfenic acid. By contrast, uh, research over the past couple of years that has been done by David Marcinic Group, uh, as well as others, have been able to clearly demonstrate that there are a lot more glutathionylation targets within cells. For example, with David Marcinic, 
which I'm going to talk about a bit later, he was able to demonstrate in two papers that there are over 2,000 glutathionylation targets in muscle. And these glutathionylation events are actually quite sensitive to two things. Uh, they change in response to exercise. The second thing is that they, uh, there's actually differences in aged mice that are undergoing sarcopenia. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. The last thing with glutathionylation and signal amplification is that the reactions are enzymatically mediated. Now we know glutathione S transferases also uh, catalyze these reactions, but I'm just going to talk about glutaredoxins. So glutaredoxins are a small family of thiol oxidoreductase that are part of the, the thyroidoxin superfamily. And essentially what they do is they utilize a catalytic cysteine thiol, and you can see here it's ionized. That catalytic thiol has a pKa of around 3.9, so it's going to ionize quite rapidly. It binds to a target protein that's been glutathionylated and transfers the glutathionyl moiety from the protein to the active site of the glutaredoxin. This occurs through a simple thiol disulfide exchange reaction. Next, the glutaredoxin protein, now with glutathione bound to its active site, binds to a second glutathione moiety to resolve that glutathione protein disulfide which reactivates the glutaredoxin, generating uh, glutathione disulfide. Now, the thing to remember here too is that glutaredoxin is reversible. So it catalyzes deglutathionylation as well uh, as glutathionylation. So for a glutathionylation event to occur, the glutathione pool has to be oxidized. This is where glutaredoxin picks up a glutathione, binds it to its active site, and then transfers it to the protein. When the glutathione pool is more reduced, it goes in the opposite direction. So I mentioned that glutathionylation events are ubiquitous. Uh, they occur throughout the cell. They're involved in immune cell function, uh, gene activation, calcium buffering, ion signaling, you name it, it does it. Uh, but they're especially prevalent within mitochondria. And we know now after 20 years, this was basically kickstarted by Arne Holmgren, uh, Marjorie, Marjorie Liu, Michael, Michael Murphy uh, at Cambridge. And then uh, people like me picked it up afterwards. Uh, we know now that glutathionylation uh, reversibly regulates uh, various elements of fuel combustion and ATP production, proton leaks, protein folding events within the intermembrane space, mitochondrial shape, so mitochondrial fission infusion, solute transport, and the activation of apoptosis. But when I was hired in 2015, there was one glaring outlier, to me anyways, in this particular field. Not a lot of people looked at whether or not it controls reactive oxygen species production. So in 2015, when I started my laboratory, and I remember having conversations with Jason Traber about this, we're like, hey, you know, like there's, there's more than complex one within mitochondria that produces uh, reactive oxygen species. There are 11 other sources. You have alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, branch chain ketoacid dehydrogenase. So I started thinking to myself, I'm like, well, maybe it does the same thing that it does the complex one. And within complex one, we knew at the time, and this was discovered by uh, Michael Murphy through a number of papers in JBC. I did a little bit of work on this during my postdoc and, the, and a little bit afterwards when I started my own lab, was that complex one, when the glutathione pool is oxidized, is inhibited by glutathionylation. And this inhibition occurs when you modify the subunit NDUSF1, which serves as the NADH binding site. Now it does turn off NADH oxidation, but at the same time, it turns down superoxide production as well. Now, if you reduce that pool, if you restore the reductive capacity of that glutathione pool, glutaredoxin two drives the deglutathionylation of complex one, which reactivates the enzyme complex, but also increases the amount of ROS being formed. So as I mentioned, there are Complex one and three are not the only sites for ROS production within mitochondria. There are 10 other ones. So some prominent ones include pyruvate dehydrogenase and alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. And I was really interested at the time in looking at whether or not glutathionylation could inhibit ROS production by these two flavin-dependent dehydrogenases. And the reason for that was at the same time, work was coming out from Martin Brand's group where they showed that both alpha keto acid dehydrogenases generate more ROS than complex one in muscle, so eight times and four times more respectively. In 2017, my group published a paper where we found the same thing in liver mitochondria, where alpha keto glutarate dehydrogenase accounts for 35% of the ROS coming from the mitochondria, and complex one was negligible. And then also, too, at the same time, several studies have demonstrated 
that alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase can be glutathione related. So when I started my lab, obviously you don't have a lot of money. So you have to figure out, you have to be creative and you have to figure out ways to test your hypotheses. So at the time I was like, well, you know, nobody, nobody worked on this. So I'm just going to take purified alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase and pyruvate dehydrogenase of porcine heart origin and determine as to whether or not if I glutathionylate it, does it turn down both the activity and the ROS production by the enzyme. So we can see the enzyme complex here. You have the uh, alpha keto acid decarboxylase E1 subunit. Uh, you have the transacylase subunit here. This is E2. And then of course you have your dehydrogenase here, which contains an FAD, which also happens to be the site for ROS production. Pyruvate and alpha ketoglutarate get oxidized by the E1 subunit, which uh, results in carbon dioxide evolution. Uh, the uh, acyl groups get transferred to the uh, lipoic acid residues here in E2, which then generates an acyl CoA in the presence of your coenzyme A. The transfer event results in the reduction of lipoic acid to a dihydrolipoamide, which is then oxidized to reactivate this E2 subunit by E3. The electrons flow through E3 and, FA and the FAD center, then reducing NAD to NADH. The idea here was, well, we know that the vicinal files within E2 subunit are amenable to oxidation. So one is the glutathionylation event occurring within the E2 subunit, and two, does this glutathionylation event turn off ROS production by the enzyme? So in 2016, uh, my group published this paper where we investigated only alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. The glutathionylation catalyst here was just glutathione disulfide. And I didn't get the result I wanted. It was still published anyways, but there was a small but significant decrease in both hydrogen peroxide production and the activity of the enzyme. These were measured at the same time uh, within the microplate reader. So you can see here on the left, we're measuring hydrogen peroxide uh, using Amplex Ultra Red and then autofluorescence of NADH on the right. So the result wasn't good enough. I wasn't satisfied with it. So we decided to do it again. This time it was uh, with two talented students I had in my laboratory, uh, Marissa O'Brien and Julia Chalker. Uh, so what we did here is we took the purified pyruvate dehydrogenase and we incubated it with increasing amounts of diamide, which happens to be a pretty good glutathionylation catalyst. So essentially what it does is it activates the glutathione and allows for its transfer to an available, available protein cysteine file. Now we can see here that when we increase the amount of diamide, there's a direct relationship between the concentration and the, the amount of hydrogen peroxide being produced. And we can see here that when we get up to higher concentrations, you almost abolish hydrogen peroxide production. You also abolish the activity of the enzyme. So we wanted to make sure that this was associated with a glutathionylation event. So we decided to do some immunoblotting with an anti-PDH cocktail. So this is an antibody for all three subunits of pyruvate dehydrogenase and an anti-protein glutathione mixed disulfide antibodies. So this is detecting the glutathionylation event. So the first thing you can see here is that there was an electrophoretic shift in the mobility of the three different subunits indicating there was a modification. The second thing is that when we probe with the anti-PSSG antibody, we can see here that we get immunoreactive bands corresponding to all three subunits of pyruvate dehydrogenase. Specifically, we see the most staining of the E2 subunit indicating to us that yes, it is indeed the target for glutathionylation. And here we just wanted to confirm that the anti-PSSG was detecting uh, protein glutathione addicts. So what we did here is we treated our samples with uh, beta mercaptoethanol. Uh, beta mercaptoethanol is a good reducting, uh, reducing agent, so it removes glutathione moieties. You can see here that we have no immunoreactive bands. But it's all well and good to play with purified enzymes. So what we decided to do afterwards is scale it up to uh, mitochondria. So in this particular case, what we did is we incubated our liver mitochondria uh, in alpha ketoglutarate and different concentrations of diamide. And you can see a nice dose dependent response uh, uh, in the diamide reaction with hydrogen peroxide production. So we can see a decrease in here. We wanted to confirm the results here. We used disulfiram. You might recognize the name. It was used to actually treat alcoholics way back in the day. And now we use it uh, to as a glutathionylation catalyst. And you can see here that we were able to confirm our results that uh, Glutathionylation actually induces a robust decrease in the amount of peroxide being generated by these mitochondria. So the next thing we did was a bio-G switch assay. So if uh, disulfiram was modifying um, the uh, 
uh, out modifying alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, then we should be able to switch out that glutathione homoiety with biotin labeled glutathione. And the biotin labeled glutathione allows us to pull it out by immunoprecipitation and then do Western blot to see as to whether or not it's being modified. And in this particular case here, what we did is we did the BioG switch on mitochondria treated with nothing, with diamide and disulfiram. And we can see here in the presence of diamide and disulfiram, there is more uh, BioG bound to alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, indicated it was more modified. And this was actually the E2 subunit. Same thing with pyruvate dehydrogenase. So there's a decrease in ROS production in the presence of diamide and disulfiram. We also did the BioG switch assay and we were able to find that it was the E2 subunit that was exclusively being modified. But we decided to follow this up because this was the first time that pyruvate dehydrogenase was being shown to be glutathione So we did another round of IPs with uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase and we're able to detect the E2 subunit of pyruvate dehydrogenase and the glutathione moiety. So the next step for us, and within those studies, we were adding exogenously added glutaridoxin 2 to determine as to whether or not glutaridoxin 2 can deglutathione the proteins, and we were able to demonstrate that. But it still wasn't good enough for us, so we decided to get our hands on a glutaridoxin 2 knockout model and determine as to whether or not if we knock out glutaridoxin 2, does this increase the glutathionylation of pyruvate dehydrogenase and alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase? So we were able to demonstrate just that. So if you uh, isolated in mitochondria, or liver mitochondria, sorry, from the GRIX2 heterozygotes and the homozygotes, we're able to demonstrate that there was a significant decrease in the amount of ROS being formed. And again, we decided to do a BioG switch assay on mitochondria collected from wild type and glutaridoxin 2 knockout mice. And we performed these assays in the presence or absence of beta mercaptal ethanol. And the BioG switch assay was able to demonstrate that there was more glutathionylation of the E2 subunit in pyruvate dehydrogenase as well as the E2 subunit of the uh, alpha keto acid, uh, alpha keto glutarate dehydrogenase. And they abcam switched out the antibodies on, uh, on us here. We were, we were pretty disappointed. This is the best we got. And but it, we, we still got it in the paper anyways, but it was, yeah, we were, we were pretty frustrated with abcam. Uh, so, uh, so that brings us to the next thing. So, uh, so for four years, we were studying mitochondria and its ability to turn down uh, ROS production by the alpha keto acid dehydrogenases complex one and complex two. And this led me to write a hypothesis paper where I was hypothesizing that protein S glutathionylation reactions were actually a global inhibitor for cell metabolism for the desensitization of hydrogen peroxide signals. So we know that glutathionylation, yes, it is a very important cell signaling mechanism, but also at the same time, it seems that it's also be uh, playing double duty, where it's feeding back on sites for hydrogen peroxide production to turn it down, to turn off these enzymes temporarily so cells can recover their antioxidant machinery to re reduce the glutathione pool so they can protect themselves from oxidative stress while they're using hydrogen peroxide for signaling. So this is some unpublished data. We have, we have a lot more. We were looking at the other uh, sources of ROS production within mitochondria, uh, but this is stuff that we just started doing with xanthine dehydrogenase or xanthine oxidoreductase. So uh, again, here we purified the enzyme and we studied it in the presence of disulfiram and diamide. And we were able to demonstrate that within the xanthine oxidoreductase, if you glutathionylate it, you actually abolish hydrogen peroxide production by the enzyme complex. Now, what was really interesting here is we did, we did experiments with glutaridoxins and we found that the glutaridoxins were not able to glutathionylate uh, the xanthine oxidoreductase. Uh, so I, um, I, I wrote a couple of, of papers and uh, a lot of times in the reviews are like, you know what, you don't, you don't do anything on glutathione as transferase. We, we know it, it participates in glutathionylation as well. So I was like, okay, well, I'll take the advice of the reviewers and I think I'm going to do this now because they keep bringing it up. So I decided uh, with a very talented student in my lab named Megan Latourno, uh, we uh, took the purified enzyme and we incubated it in increasing amounts of glutathione and glutathione as transferase. This is the amount you would find within a cell around 0.5 micromolar. And we noticed that there was a robust decrease in the activity of the enzyme in response to the presence of GST and glutathione. And we almost abolished hydrogen peroxide production by the purified enzyme. Next, here comes the COVID response. So 
Uh, after I got my lab up and running at McGill, I had two good months of research and then everything came to a screeching halt. So at the time you're trying to figure out, okay, you know, when we come back, how are we, uh, how are we gonna design these experiments? How am I gonna limit students' contact time so they don't potentially contract the virus or how do we mitigate it and stuff like that. So what I decided to do instead of bringing in animals, which could also be a source of COVID, um, I relied on a company named Z Xenotech and I bought liver homogenate from Xenotech because we wanted to look at the xanthine oxide reductase and the glutathionylation event within the liver cytoplasm. So one of the first things we did is we decided to take this liver homogenate or this liver cytoplasm, incubate it into disulfiram and measure hydrogen peroxide production in the presence of hypoxanthine. And we were able to demonstrate that the disulfiram was able to turn down peroxide production by the xanthine oxide reductase. We did the same thing with diamide and we found this the exact same thing. So the diamide induced the dose dependent decrease in xanthine mediated ROS production by this liver cytoplasm. Finally, we have hydrogen peroxide production uh, in the presence of glutathione as transferase and glutathione. We can see here, we have a nice, again, dose dependent decrease almost being abolished at 10 millimolar reduced glutathione. So just a quick summary and where this has led my, my group. So glutathionylation is a ubiquitous and reversible redox modification that is required to regulate a diverse array of cellular functions. And there are many targets within mitochondria. And so far, my group has been able to find that glutathionylation is a negative feedback loop that inhibits mitochondrial ROS production, and it temporarily shuts down the enzyme, which is then reversed by glutaredoxin 2. And it also may be a global cell inhibitor for ROS production because we were able to demonstrate that xanthine oxide reductase within the liver cytoplasm is also inhibited by glutathionylation. But what about aberrant glutathionylation events? So like with any other signaling mechanism, the glutathionylation or the covalent modification needs to be temporary. There cannot be uh, any errors with the addition or removal of that uh, group from the protein. And the same rules apply to glutathionylation. As you saw here, glutathionylation is inhibiting the enzyme. Now that's really important because it needs to turn down ROS production during signaling. This is a protective mechanism and it allows cells to utilize hydrogen peroxide for signaling while at the same time protecting themselves from its toxic influence. But if you have prolonged glutathionylation and prolonged inhibition of your mitochondrial enzymes, what are the consequences? So we know now based on the uh, literature that prolonged or dysfunctional glutathionylation events can lead to heart disease, obesity, defects in, in embryonic development, uh, predisposes uh, rodents to the premature development of cataracts, and we even have dysfunctional immune cell responses. And this leads us into, can we prom uh, utilize promotion of deglutathionylation to protect mitochondria or to protect uh, uh, protect from the development of metabolic diseases? So this is an example here that I, my group recently published this paper in collaboration with John Usher at uh, the University of Alberta, where we're able to demonstrate that the GLP-1 receptor agonist, liraglutide, I, I, can't, I can't pronounce that word, I'm sorry, uh, liraglutide, uh, was able to uh, increase glucose clearance and oxidation within the myocardium of a diabetic cardio cardiomyopathy uh, mouse model. And in this particular case, it was associated with the deglutathionylation of pyridate dehydrogenase and its activation. And then this is that paper I was talking about by David Marcinek's group. So that well, they published two, I'll just talk about this one really quickly. Uh, they were able to demonstrate that the mitochondria, mitochondria targeted antioxidant SS31 peptide is able to reverse age-related redox stress and improve exercise tolerance in aged mice. But what they were able to show, which was really exciting is that this was related to the deglutathionylation of proteins within these mitochondria, suggesting that one, if you prolong glutathionylation of proteins within mitochondria, which is possible uh, in disease storage states or age states because you're gonna have more oxidized glutathione available, it might actually disable mitochondrial functions. And two, if you can actually target these mitochondria and promote uh, the, the reduction of those glutathione pools, does it promote the deglutathionylation of these proteins and their reactivation? So this is where uh, some of the work that we've done recently comes in. So when I was doing my postdoc with Mary Ellen Harper, I was working with the uncoupling protein three, trying to figure out how it works. And we found that it not only gets glutathionylated, but glutaredoxin two is required to turn it off by glutathionylation. 
Now, what was really intriguing about this is that if we promote the deglutathionylation of UCP3, it increases proton leaks to protect from reactive oxygen species overproduction. But also at the same time, within this glutaroxin 2 knockout mouse model, we're able to demonstrate that this is also associated with an increase in protein uh, proton leaks, mitochondrial respiration, overall energy expenditure, and a small but significant decrease in body mass. So I picked this up a little bit later in starting in 2019, uh, 2017, and a talented, a talented graduate student in my laboratory worked on this for two years up until the summer of 2019. The project was if we take wild type and glutaroxin 2 heterozygotes, subject them to a high fat diet, are they partially protected from diet induced obesity? And this was based on the findings from my postdoc. So what we did here is we used a high fat or a control match diet. Uh, we measured body weight, blood glucose, a variety of other parameters weekly. And then at 10 weeks of age, we euthanized the mice and we did a variety of experiments. And basically what we wanted to do here is we did the 10 week model because we just wanted to see one, is there any weight gain? And two, if there is weight gain, um, are the GRIX2 heterozygotes partially protected from it? We confirmed that GRIX2 activity was 50% down within the heterozygotes. Now, the first intriguing result that we had was within the GRIX2 heterozygotes, there was a significant almost 50% decrease in the number of glutathionylation adducts within our muscle mitochondria. So this led us to start studying these, these, these mice and determining as to whether or not our hypothesis was true. We were wrong. To our surprise, the GRIX2 heterozygotes fed a high fat diet were completely protected from diet induced obesity. And we can see the green line here representing the wild type fed a high fat diet over the seven week period. There's, and this was not surprising that the C57 black six N mice are prone to developing diet, diet induced obesity when given a high fat diet, even over a short time. But what really surprised us was the weight uh, gain profile of the GRIX2 heterozygotes, which matched the control groups. We thought it was associated with food intake. And there was a 10% increase in food intake within the wild type mice fed a high fat diet, but it wasn't significantly different when compared to the other groups. We next looked at a variety of parameters such as um, uh, organ mass and tissue mass, no significant changes in heart and kidney. There was a really interesting significant decrease in liver mass, which I'll talk about in a second. But what we found was with abdominal fat pad mass was that there was a significant increase within the wild types fed a high fat diet, but the GRIX2 heterozygotes had a abdominal fat pad mass, which was similar to the control groups. Okay, so now that we, we did that, we started running with it. So we're like, okay, so let's look at other markers for uh, diet-induced obesity and whether or not the GRIX2s are truly protected from it. So next we targeted the liver and we sectioned the liver and we did some simple H&E staining. We can see the staining pattern for the wild types that a, a control diet and the GRIX2s that either diet was quite similar to one another. And it was a nice stain. What really surprised us again was in the wild type heterozygote, uh, wild type at a high fat diet, was that there was uh, a lot of empty space inside the hepatocytes, uh, vacuolization, which we did not see in the GRIX2 heterozygotes. So obviously we moved into doing an oil red O stain. And we were able to show that, okay, in the wild types that a high fat diet, there was a significant accumulation of neutral, lipid, neutral intrahepatic lipids uh, within the liver cells, but we didn't see that in the GRIX2 heterozygotes. We also did a glycogen stain. So in models for diet-induced obesity, glycogen granules become depleted because uh, these mice are trying to maintain blood glucose levels. And what we found was in the wild type mice, there was a significant depletion of glycogen granules uh, following uh, high fat diet feeding, which again, we did not see in the GRIX2 heterozygotes. So we measured a bunch of other parameters as well. So triglyceride levels, insulin levels, uh, I'm not going through all the data, but we found there was a significant rise in uh, circulated triglycerides in the wild type mice, so the high fat diet, whereas in the GRIX2s, it was similar to the control. And we found the same thing with insulin. So it, insulin was really high within the wild type mice, said that the high fat diet, and there was a significant increase in the GRIX2 heterozygotes. So it implies that they're not fully protected from diet induced obesity, but still in comparison to the wild types, they got pretty good protection from the high fat diet. 
Okay, so what's going on here? So we decided to isolate our mitochondria and measure the different states of respiration utilizing a variety of different uh, fuels. So in this particular case, we started the pyruvate malate. And what we were able to show here was that in state three and state four respiration, the respiratory rates for the Grixu who had a residual excited either diet were two to threefold higher in comparison to the wild type, suggesting that they're burning more fuels, but this might be associated with an increase in proton leaks. We found the same thing with succinic acid. So there was a two to threefold increase in respiration under state three and state four conditions. And we found the same thing with palmitoyl carnitine. So there was a fourfold difference between the Grix2 heterozygotes and the wild type mice. And there was also a significant increase in state four respiration as well. So we looked at this and we thought to ourselves, okay, well, we know, we know now there's an increase in fuel metabolism. And this may be attributed to proton leaks. So we decided to probe into that a little bit further by looking at both UCP3 and ANT. And essentially what we did here is we isolated our mitochondria, treated them immediately with oligomycin. We measured proton leaks, and then we treated the mitochondria again with inhibitors for ANT, such as octanol carnitine. And we treat it again with GDP, which is an inhibitor for UCP3. And then on the other arm, we take a second population of mitochondria and give them nothing but UCP3 inhibitors, so GDP and genepin. And we did these injections sequentially. So for the UCP3, what we were able to find was GDP and genepin induce a 40 to 50% per percent decrease in proton leak dependent restoration. Now, this 40 to 50% per percent decrease in respiration implies that UCP3 is more active in the Grix2 heterozygote mitochondria isolated from the muscle. And it's the same thing for ANT. So we injected the ANT inhibitor octanol and carnitine, and we saw this significant drop again, indicating that proton leak through ANT is more active in the Grix2 heterozygous mitochondria. We then injected GDP with the octanol carnitine into the mitochondria, and we saw or a, a further drop in uh, proton leak dependent restoration, which was far more significant than the Grix2 heterozygotes. Okay, so the next thing for us was to measure ROS production by these mitochondria. So we measured ROS production utilizing a variety of different steels. So we have pyruvate malate, succinate, and palmitol carnitine. And overall, we found that the Grix2 heterozygous, uh, the mitochondria, muscle mitochondria from the Grix2 heterozygotes, produce significantly more when compared to the wild types. Now, this might be off-putting. It might imply that the hydrogen peroxide might be doing oxidative damage, but we also have to remember that it induces adaptive signaling mechanisms. So we decided to look at palmitoyl carnitine levels, and there was a significant increase in the wild type mice that a high fat diet within those mitochondria, which we did not see in the Grix2 heterozygotes. And we also found that within the, within the serum, sorry, of the Grix2 heterozygotes, there was a significant increase in the availability of total glutathione, and there was an increase in the reductive capacity of the glutathione pool as well. Now, this would indicate that the hydroperoxide coming from these mitochondria are actually inducing adaptive signaling mechanisms, maybe from Nrf2, to increase uh, redox buffering capacity within muscle tissue. So just in summary, so we found that when we take male mice that are Western diet, the wild type mice uh, develop diet induced obesity, uh, potentially fatty liver disease, as well as insulin resistance. But when you knock out one of the two genes encoding glutaroxin 2, there's protection from diet induced obesity, lipid accumulation within the liver, there's glycogen pool maintenance, and potentially insulin resistance. Uh, sorry, potentially protection from insulin resistance. This was associated with an increase in fuel metabolism, proton leaks, and a decrease in the total number of glutathione-related proteins, and an increase in hydroperoxide production, which uh, uh, serves as an adaptive signaling mechanism to augment antioxidant defenses. And just really quickly, so this was published by my group just a couple of months ago. Uh, we did the same investigation, but with female mice. And as you would expect, the response was completely different. Uh, so we found that the wild type female litter mates were completely resistant to diet induced obesity, unlike the male wild type litter mates, which we demonstrated uh, were quite sensitive towards the high fat diet. If we delete one of the two copies for glutaroxin 2 gene, it does not provide any additional protection to these mice. 
Glutathione elation is not required to inhibit ROS production. So again, this is something only associated with the male mice. Now, the um, lack of reliance on glutathione elation to inhibit ROS production, uh, we found was attributed to the higher antioxidant ROS handling cap capacities of both the liver mitochondria and the muscle mitochondria isolated from the female mice. In addition to that, we also observed that fat combustion uh, so palmitoyl oil carnitine oxidation, as well as the oxidation of other fuels within the muscle mitochondria from the female mice was more efficient. So I'd like to thank everybody that did this amazing work from my group, uh, the undergraduate students that have gone through my laboratory, they were fantastic. They did amazing work. Same with the graduate students that I currently have now here at, uh, at McGill, as well as the graduate students that I trained when I was at Memorial University, as well as my research technician and postdoctoral fellow that's coming into the laboratory, uh, also doing some amazing work, as well as my collaborators. Uh, a lot of these people I work with on some of these projects, like John Usher and Jason Traberg, Helmut Sees, obviously a, a huge inspiration for a lot of the work that you just saw. And here are some of the funding sources for this work. Uh, thank you. Ryan, thank you very much. That was uh, very good, very instructive. Boy, I I, uh, I learned a uh, got relearned again about redox redox uh, stress and and metabolism. Very good. I'd like to ask the audience to use the Q and A uh, button to ask some questions. I'm sure Ryan would take a few questions. Um, well, that's a great list of collaborators uh, and associates there, Ryan. That's very good. So I need, I need, uh, I thought I was understanding very well. And then I thought, okay, wait a minute, maybe I'm not. Because you were initially, we were discussing um, um, glutathione elation as a process that inhibits ROS in, you know, isolated enzymes or in, or in mitochondria. And that, that to me, meant, okay, inhibiting ROS, that seems like a good thing because you're gonna get it down to the cell signaling level, which is kind of the level we want it at, not excessive, not provoking cell death, that kind of thing. Uh, but then you spoke about a couple of papers that uh, led to, I don't know, healthier benefits with deglutathionylation. And I, I just wondered, is it better to have glutathionylation and reduce reactive oxygen species production, or is it should we be deglutathionylating? <laughs> What's the best way to go here? Uh, so, I, I think it's not. Uh, um, I don't think it's it's. Uh, should we be more deglutathionylated or more glutathionylated? I think it's uh, when you see these disease states. Usually, what happens is you have oxidative distress, so you have oxidation of your glutathione pool. Uh, this leads to glutathionylation, but prolonged glutathionylation, like for a long period of time. So the proteins are inactive. Um, a really, really good example of that, and this is why I didn't include, um, I didn't include the group two homozygotes uh, to to the study, uh, is because when you completely knock out glutaroxin two, it leads to a fifty percent drop in ATP production by heart mitochondria. And the, these heart, these mito, these, these hearts, uh, they develop left left ventricular uh, uh, hypertrophy fibrosis. Uh, they lose they lose their uh, metabolic flexibility, so they can't burn fuels like you know fats or amino acids anymore. And it's largely attributed attributed to the prolonged inactivation of complex one by glutathionylation. So, in terms of regulating ROS levels and availability, um, the very short inhibition, and I don't know how, how long, I, I, I have no clue, but uh, uh, the temporary deactivation of these proteins to regulate ROS production likely serves as a very good mechanism to turn off uh, or desensitize that higher peroxide signal. But if you leave that glutathione moiety on there for too long, then you're going to start compromising ATP production and that kind of stuff in mitochondria. Now, here comes the question about ROS now. Uh, so we know that with prolonged, <coughs> excuse me, prolonged glutathionylation of mitochondrial proteins, it turns off the oxidation of NADH, right? So you're not going to be burning fuels coming from the Krebs cycle or 
you know, amino acid pathways or anything like that. If you want to burn fuel to make ATP, you have to go through ubiquinone. So you have to burn proline or glycerol like three phosphate, or sorry, glycerol three phosphate or succinate. And this is something that we've just started doing. So we were able to demonstrate that if you glutathione complex one and you feed mitochondria glycerol three phosphate or proline or any other substrate that feeds electrons directly into the ubiquinone pool, it actually increases the amount of ROS production. And you can turn that down by inhibiting complex one with rotenone. So you know, you have this whole disaster scenario being set up where you have the prolonged inhibition of, let's say, complex one. You can't burn NADH dependent or NAD dependent fuels anymore. You have to rely on ubiquinone. All of a sudden, you have all this reverse electron transfer. You're going to turn that off because it's going to be disastrous and you're going to induce oxidative distress. So the temporary glutathione elation, yeah, it, I, I think based on our findings that it could serve as a really important mechanism to turn down ROS production for signaling. But if you have that aberrant prolonged glutathione elation event, that's where you start running into trouble. Yeah, sure. That sounds that sounds great. Yeah, very good explanation there. Okay, let me uh, go to the Q and A uh, and get some questions here. Francois Marchildon asks, in terms of the muscle weight in the GRX2 heterozygous mice, is there muscle hypertrophy or hyperplasia? What does the muscle look like? Okay, so uh, <laughs> so this is. Um, so the Grix2 most model has only been around since 2010, I'd say. So it hasn't been around that long. Outside of Marjorie Lou's group, uh, Mary Ellen and Harper and I are the only ones that ever worked with it. So um, yeah, that's a really great question. I have no idea. Okay. Yeah. This is yeah. something. This is something that this is something that I really, I really want to. I really want to get like dig my dig my fingers into because um, I, I often wondered, are they more um, uh, resistant to like exhaustive exercise or, you know, anything like that? Like what, uh, what's the status on that, right? Is right. it, that is an exercise mimetic. So uh, in terms of hypertrophy, that's a really good question. I have no idea. Fiber hyperplasia, we haven't done any fiber staining, staining uh, so I couldn't tell you, uh, but this is definitely something that's on the block for us to do. The muscle looks the same. Um, and as you saw in this figure, I'll just go over here. Um, so there was, we just did total uh, dry muscle mass, uh, you know, but uh, there was a significant decrease in the wild type and it recovered in the Grix2 heterozygotes. So uh, maybe there's something there. Uh, what is the gene expression level of myostatin? Yeah, I don't know the other two. Yeah. Let me let me go on to let me go on to some other questions, Ryan. Okay. Uh, so, uh, just on that note, uh, did you measure you you saw the mitochondrial composition change? You saw the respiration change. Is there any change in mitochondrial content in the muscle at all? Uh, did you measure a marker in whole muscle to see if mitochondrial content had gone up or down or? Uh, uh, well, so when we look at the uh, total protein content. It's always usually the same. But that's not a very good metric measure for whether or not there's an increase in mitochondrial proliferation or, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, we did, in the same study, uh, measure the expression levels of uh, a couple of protein three, a uh, bunch of the complexes and that kind of stuff. And we found no, no difference in the expression levels for a lot of these proteins. So, okay. um, good question. I, I, I couldn't tell you. Okay. We're losing your volume there a little bit, Ryan. Oh, yeah. uh, Come on in a little closer there. Okay, Peter Bax uh, asks, uh, great talk. You showed nicely uh, data supporting the notion that increased glutathione oxidation feeds back to reduce various pathways involved in ROS production. Your data also showed that intermediate low level uh, diamide levels caused increased ROS. Can you comment on the relevance of this positive feedback? Yeah, so, um, so this has been something uh, this is something we're looking at right now using disulfiram and diamide. The first thing we have to remember is these are non-specific glutathione elation catalysts. So this glutathione elation event could be occurring anywhere. So um, it could, under certain circumstances, increase ROS production. The second thing is that we're looking at this right now where we're finding that when you incubate mitochondria in uh, disulfiram or diamide, and then you give them substrates like succinic acid or uh, 
uh, proline or glycerol 3 phosphate, it actually augments ROS production. We're finding that is associated with reverse electron transfer to complex one. So I guess the, the answer to your question is it really depends on what fuel is being burned and where those electrons are going. Because if you have a glutathione elation event for complex one, you're modifying NUFS1, which prevents NADH oxidation. So the electrons are not available for ROS production. So it goes down. But if you do the same experiment and give them a substrate like succinic acid or proline, the electrons are entering into ubiquinone and coming back down. And they accumulate within the FAD, resulting in an increase in ROS production. Um, now, it's really important to note as well is that uh, there are several studies that were done back, I think, in 2007, 2006, where they did find that glutathione elation increased ROS production, but at the same time, their hypothesis generated was, well, this could be through reverse electron transfer within these mitochondria. Sorry, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, good. Uh, so thank you. So Stephen Alway, Stephen Alway asks, uh, thank you for an interesting talk. Does increasing deglutathionylation result in any changes in antioxidants in the mitochondrion, such as MN-SOD? Uh, 